based upon their yeah. But I think people don't feel alone anymore, and, and therefore doesn't it solidify their their independence? They get more cohesive as a group, but they, they, the groups drift further apart. And from are each tempted other. to play out further yeah. to go further. But, than but I think the psychological otherwise. notion of fantasy is really about a, a narrative, um, an imaginary narrative that enhances something or explores something. And I think the issue that Vern's bringing up is really more about. Um, a deeper psychological substructure in terms of gender identity and so forth. I, I, my, my sense is it's not these individuals have fantasies about being the opposite sex, but they actually feel at a very deep, intimate level that they belong in the opposite sex. And so through some quirk of nature, they've ended up in that. Yeah. Um, but what does is, what is the nature of fantasy uh, uh, teach us about what the nature of sex is? Because fantasy is something that's very focused on sex oftentimes. Uh, what, what does it tell us about sex? Well, I mean, it's twofold, one of which is the extent to which we're obsessed with, particularly male obsessed, with having something that really enhances and solidifies and makes more virtual our fantasy life. But what it's also saying is the extent to which we're willing to forgo intimacy for that opportunity. And we'll drive these enormous economic machines in terms of how much money we're going to get from, or, or how much these uh, industries are going to get from our use of such things like, like uh, dial porn and X-rated videos and the internet. But it also speaks to the extent of what's, what's missing in the contextual relationship side. But is it a little bit like sugar where we have a drive towards getting uh, sweetness? We like that because it's great when you just have fruit that you're seeking, but when you have an easy access to all sorts of French pastries, it becomes a problem and we have to deal with that. And it sort of seems to me that some of this uh, omnipresence of, of, sexual, of, of sexual fare is, uh, leads us down the same Yeah, but the question path. is whether, it's a, whether you're motivated to something or avoiding something else. I mean, some arguments were, were basically we're because of, intimacy. yeah, we're, we're right. avoiding intimacy and the challenges and the fears associated with intimacy. And so we look for this easy opportunity here. This is sort of the male well, psychology of it. I, I don't accept the dismissal of my use of transsexuals quite as in the sense of not being fantasy. Let's turn it wasn't to, meant to, 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 <laughs> to cross-dressing in a sense. Many people have always wanted to know what the other sex is like, or the other gender is like, and living it. And in terms of role-playing, I mean, it becomes very easy on the internet to masquerade as a person of the other sex or another you age. You whoever and you want to be. Yes, and that, is and that, good that or bad? certainly is... Well, this is one of the places. Well, it's really certainly fantasy, exploring one's fantasies and exploring and curiosities, and uh, it seems to me that these are the kinds of things we're going to have to be dealing with increasingly. Well, it's interesting. ASEC, uh, the American Journal for Sex Educators and Therapists, uh, reported on some research a couple of years ago that couples who watch pornography together have more excitement in that particular sexual event, but over time they lose it more and more and they get less and less turned on to each other. That's not part of your therapy? Then? No. Externalizing the fantasy rather than internalizing the fantasy and sharing the fantasy in the relationship from inside of our brain and between each other can enhance but when it's long term and bring us closer together but when it's something outside of us that stimulates and Especially as the internet can be addictive. Right, right. and Do stimulates you have that kind patients of patients that uh, that are starting to use the internet in sex and causing problems. Oh, we deal with that all the mm -hmm. time. Right. Where the, in fact, we have couples where there's almost no sex going on at all because the man is getting all of his gratification from the internet, and it usually uh, happens that they come to therapy at the point where he gets busted by her. And, and now he has to, to, to face up to the fact that he's getting all his gratification over there. Nothing's happening between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, we as men tend to always be looking for something new. And this is one of the places where there's, there's a difference. But, but it's only new, but quick. Quick. New and quick. <laughs> but Whereas women are looking for, for something yeah. Yeah. deeper. But internet and, only allows men to do this before they have their outs with the prostitution, go to a girly show when they have the connection, still lack the but intimacy. But it, the difference is that now it's in everybody's home, whereas you had to and get out there and head down to the other part of town But that's, that's the future of sex. I mean, the, yes. it's exactly. technologically exactly. driven. Yeah. Yeah. And you that you has can't has avoid that. That's going to happen more and more. Absolutely. I mean, there's a big difference if you can do it in 20 seconds and you don't even have to get that's out right. of That's right. <laughs> from, from my perspective, this is the evolution of male masturbation. This mm -hmm. really is a limited domain. It's not really to the future of sex, but the evolution of male masturbation. But, but there'll be more and more technological solutions to making fantasy 
um, seem more real, but ultimately it's, it, it misses the driving force in a relationship, driving force being the kind of intimate connections and the mm -hmm. kinds so of what, psychological consequences well, what, that what, come what, from What are you sex. saying? You're saying it's, it, it, it's inevitable, but it's bad? Well, <laughs> it doesn't fulfill. It, uh, you it's inevitable. It's separate from sex in a sense. But well, it, it's just one aspect of non-reproductive sex. I mean, what, a lot of this is just a discussion about male masturbation, parading under the idea of the future of sex. Well, what happens is, as reproduction is increasingly decoupled from sex because of not only contraceptives, but as we move forward in time, how will that impact the nature of how we use sex in relationships and with others that we are less intimate yeah. with? Let me just take the, the, the thought question that suppose reproduction has nothing to do with sex anymore. Uh, what then happens to sex? Well, it changes the whole outlook of society, mm -hmm. and we're doing that somewhat. The whole fight of gays for equality is a sense, in essence, a legal removal of reproduction mm -hmm. from sex and mm -hmm. from marriage. Well, it's interesting for us dealing with unconsummated marriages, which where they have not been able to have sexual intercourse. For physical reasons? For physical reasons, usually, sometimes psychological mm -hmm. or psychologically mm -hmm. oriented, but causing physical problems mm -hmm. that prevent them from being able to cons consummate their to marriages. To have normal intercourse. Right. They are having a full sexual relationship. In, much of the time they don't come for sexual therapy until they're wanting to reproduce mm. because they can satisfy, they can have, fulfill the what we see sex having really three functions procreation, pleasure, and unity or intimacy and they can fulfill the other two but they can't reproduce. So I think it's very problematic to frame human sexuality in procreative ways because if mm -hmm. the majority of human sexual expression throughout the course of the lifespan is non-reproductive. That's right. All the early childhood sexual exploration and, and all the way to the postmenopausal mm -hmm. and so forth. And our bodies are designed in, in some ways for non-reproductive purposes and ways of enjoying sexual pleasure. Such as Different than most of the, clitoris, the rest of the animals. The clitoris has no, no reproductive function. In fact, we use that pleasure. to teach in terms of women accepting that they are sexual persons with sexual needs and designed for pleasure, that they aren't just the receptacle of the male sexual aggression, that it's something that comes from within us because the, it has no other purpose in the body. Well, but we're talking about good things and bad things, and one of the real difficulties with technology is it's made sex kind of, um, uh, uh, well, the best kind of a product, and what I illustrate it with is the fertility clinics where people go and, in a sense, sex becomes a duty and you forget what marriage is about, what everything else is about. You're called, you rush down to the clinic, you go in and masturbate and have masturbation justified, perhaps even yes. by the church, <laughs> uh, and then it doesn't work. So you're afraid to have sex in between, so you go wait <laughs> till the, the next month. the bodily fluids. Yeah, uh, yeah, well yeah. Then. When sex is just for procreation, like you're talking about, it really moves us apart, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And then they end up in our office a year or two later, once they have their baby and they've adjusted yeah. to the baby. Have, have you had cases like that? Oh, yeah. A good, Frequently. A good number of cases like mm -hmm. that, where, where they came in with post-fertility sexual problems. Mm -hmm. And caused by the, the infertility, the be trying to so regulate their sexual behavior. Yeah, because behavior they had had a great sex but, but, life before. They they claimed, yeah, and then it just went downhill while they were getting. It becomes goal oriented rather than. But a part of that is because in vitro fertilization and the these kinds of reproductive technologies are still so primitive and so difficult, and so it is horribly intrusive. As they improve, then that onerous sort of. Uh, that aspect of it, I think, would be reduced. Well, I think that for, for mm. both the reproductive technologies as well as the condom technologies, I think the real risks of sex, the way we conceptualize risks of sex, are preg unwanted pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. And as you enhance the reproductive top, we're making inroads there. But we, the condoms we use now are not that different from what they were in the 17th century. Um, they're not user-friendly. Um, they diminish sexual enjoyment, pleasure, and so on. I think once hurdles like that are overcome, for example, something like um, a lubricant that, uh, in, that goes on smoothly, enhances the actual act of sex, enhances the conductivity of heat, and whatever else, that once those kinds of technical issues are solved, you'll see a greater explosion of sexuality, even when the yeah. context of relationships. It doesn't necessarily drive the male masturbation one, it actually drives the couple. So if you have no problem of sexually transmitted diseases, 
and it is not, uh, it's easily decoupled from reproduction, mm -hmm. then is it used much more broadly than in a relationship? I think it would be much more broadly, definitely.